don't go as uh, Lauren. How do you say your last name? Well, uh, I'm, I like to think of myself as between last names right now. Okay. So we'll just go with Lauren. Lauren. How about that? Uh, why well, Lauren introduced me? My name is Gino Ferrati. I'm a visiting instructor with the Nicholson School of Communications. I've been with UCF four years full time. Prior to that, I have a diverse professional background. I was involved in marketing and leasing and corporate planning for the real estate industry, and then I moved from that into the banking industry. From banking, I was in sports management and coaching for sports and athletics, and finally moved here to full time teaching. My main teaching interests center around culture, and that started when I was 21 years old, graduated from college, and took my first trip abroad to Europe, and I particularly fell in love with Italy because half of my heritage, as I'm sure you can guess by looking at me and my name, mm -hmm. is of an Italian background. Uh, the other portions are Irish, German, and Swedish, but the Italian, for some reason, really connected with me. At that point in time, I didn't understand this region, and that set me off on basically a 14 year quest to try and understand what that attraction and that connection was to that particular culture. That draw led me to my thesis work in 2007, where that's basically what I'm going to walk you through here is understanding the context for Italian culture for a very specific display of nonverbal communication for gender form. A bit of a mouthful, but I'll walk you through um, all of that process. Does anyone know what our degree does in a personal communication? Not surprised. I actually ask my students that usually on the first day to when you sit down for an interview and someone says, Oh, you do interpersonal communication, that doesn't let me get your resume. What do you do? And they have a really hard time summarizing that. So what we do is we study relationships. It's an amalgamation of sociology, psychology, and anthropology all rolled into one. The discipline started post World War II. What was going on in World War II in the world that you think would probably increase the need to study communication? Nations. So what specifically started happening during the time of World War II with nations? It really became evident to the world to be clearly connected at that point in time, and our soldiers were stationed all over the world. They were getting involved in relationships, perhaps having children. So you have uh, multinational children, multicultural children also being born, and people just falling in love with different parts, parts of the world. Advances in technology also since the time of World War II until today, air travel being relatively affordable and within reach of the average person, and the number of flights going internationally each day has increased greatly during that time. So it really became evident, even prior to the internet, that there was a need to start studying this type of stuff. So communication started with sociology, anthropology, and psychology, and has moved forward from those uh, disciplines. Let me flip that question back on you, though, so I can get a good idea of the context that we're working on. So when I ask my students, what exactly do you do with interpersonal communication? What exactly do you do with your degree? And what is the name of your degree? We'll start there. What is the name of your degree? <laughs> what is it? Business management. Business management. Okay, so that's a simple one. That was my undergrad background, actually. I was an undergraduate business management. So what do we do? You have a broad umbrella, right? So if you can summarize in just a few sentences what do you learn to do, or what can you bring to a business with business management? What's your name? Okay. Okay. You volunteered multiple times, so I should know your name. Nobody else. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, just basically we want to manage business activities, um, work, corporations, and understand you know, what it takes. And obviously most people who come on in their city and say, yeah, well, probably want to know what's taught and how to hear go by if they will be able to get some great knowledge and you know, use that to guide things in the long run. Oh absolutely, yeah. So this is just your starting point. You're just getting theory of the concepts. The thing about business management compared to some other degrees, similar to communication, our degrees are not like bio degrees. We're not doctors, we're not engineers, we're not lawyers, we're not trying to bail us out like those degrees are. So it's not that difficult if you study enough and you do your work and graduate with degrees in our fields. But that's because the real world is where you fail. Just because you get straight A's in a business degree or in communication doesn't mean you can actually do this in the real world. So yeah, it becomes critically important. If you're having difficulty and you were scared that I was going to ask you to describe what your major is, that means you're not prepared for what's called an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is basically a 30 to 60 second summary of whatever they're asking you to summarize. The amount of time it would take to step into the elevator and ride one floor with someone. It's that chit chat that would happen in that brief point of time. Get that down for yourself. 
so that when someone is asking you a networking event, you can sound really prepared, educated, and particularly on an interview process. But that's not what entirely what we're covering today, but I did want to just point that out to you because a lot of my students weren't able to do that. So elevator pitch for your overall presentation. What I do want to iron out today is I've specifically tailored this presentation, which I've done a couple different times across the campus over the past seven years, to really focus in on context, since you're studying context of cultures, specifically within business, and I really want us to understand what I'm defining as and what we're going to use as context. So overall, this is from Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, just a basic summary of the word context. But the key words are highlighted for you here with in blue and are underlined. So interrelated, environment and setting. When something's interrelated, someone just state the obvious. What does that mean? They have a connection. They have a connection. Obvious, right? It's obvious definition of work. But what's not obvious, just like I said sometimes, is you get an A in business and graduate top of your class. Obvious work. It's not always obvious to make the connection in the real world. So while we can make the definition of interrelated easy, how do we really interrelate with people who are diverse? How do we cross that cultural boundary? That becomes so much more difficult. But understanding that we are interrelated as human beings. And the environment and the setting becomes really key to understanding the context of any situation. But for the basis of this presentation, that was really the foundation of understanding why the time of men behave the way that they do compared to US men. The environment and the setting. I thought this was interesting as well, giving the background of it. Italian is a Latin-based language, like Spanish, like French, like Portuguese, like <coughs> English. And from the background, from its origins, it is to connect, to weave together. That's the idea of a context, to connect and weave together. So as we, as social scientists, zoom in, almost putting under a microscope any type of culture or human performance situation, to really isolate variables, understand what's going on in a particular instance, what we can never forget to do as scientists, or more importantly as human beings, is to reintegrate all of them and understand that no particular context happens in a vacuum, right? It happens in life, and life is multidimensional, and those dimensions never not intersect each other. They never not influence one another. So if you're isolating it to try and study it, but always trying to remember to reintegrate that back into the whole part. So let me ask you this question. Looking at the idea of context that we just covered. This is the basic plot line for looks like a lifetime movie. A man dies and a woman gets a million dollars. That's just a plot line. Someone give me some possible context that that plot line could develop into. They were husbands. What's that? They were husband and wife. Husband and wife, okay. Well, father's father's daughter. Father daughter, okay. Then how does she get a million dollars? Yes, so that could be one. There's a relationship somehow between a man and a woman. So how does she end up getting a million dollars? How is the plot? Life insurance. Yeah, the life insurance. Life insurance. Sure, that could be one aspect. How else could this plot develop in context? From an inheritance, maybe from a trust fund or a business you might have owned that she now owns. Absolutely. That's terribly plausible. Yes. A man was shot in the street and she picked up his million dollars. So she stole it off of a dying man. Stole it. Picked it up. Oh, she picked it up. Okay. <laughs> That it all, you're marketing, aren't you? It's all about your brain. Or somebody pays a woman a million dollars to kill the man. Could be. Yeah. It could be any of these. Any of it, right? We don't know the context. So one, you might feel horrible for her. She lost her husband. She lost her father. One, she's kind of a thief, maybe. She took, you know, right place, right found right. it, right? <laughs> or the other one, she's, she's a murderer. She's a hired assassin. Mm -hmm. You would feel very differently about this woman given the different context of their situations, right? Even though the facts, the basic facts about the situation is the same. So the context always matters in and it informs what's going on. So you have to understand that. I want to do a brief little exercise with you with that idea. I do this with my speech students on day one to learn about context. So we have a similar thing of what we just did with the man dies and woman gets a million dollars. We have a basic cartoon here, three panels of it. And I want you to do what we call share and pair, where you're going to just get with someone right around you, two people per group, and you're going to fill in the dialogue box with this. Afterwards, I want to hear a couple people tell how their story developed. <laughs> this is also an exercise in nonverbal communication, because we know nothing about these characters. 
Um, and that's about all I'll say for right now. So let's take five minutes, work with someone around you, fill in the boxes. <laughs> Uh, interesting answers from you. Well, I'm doing this one. That's so funny. Because I'm like, okay, she's surprised, she's happy, she's angry. I mean, look at the posture. I was like, oh, Exactly. He's like, I'm great. I have a date for the dance. She's like, yeah, I'm really happy. Who is it? Who is it? It's your sister. That's funny. This is really great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Really. You know what? And that's something that I never get a chance to do. Well, I didn't really think to go because I think, and I don't know if it's strictly such a college or business thing, that either we tend to live in our own home that much, or just that last year we got a new team. So there's been lots of changes. We should have been trying to do that. I think that, you know, that we need to be taken care of, um, as well as, you know, I think being in the as well. We need to go to the other class. Going back to what we just was talking about, about context or integrity. Uh, we didn't think to have any context. I never saw any of the things that were dropped, not letting other schools decide what was wrong. Because what you're teaching here is what we separate into business from the industry. Right. We all do the same things. I know. But your knowledge is going to be Right. We're leading the different places. Well, one of my good friends is Sunico. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's cool. Well, one of the things that I love about Sunico is that she's so unexpected. I think you have some perception of how she's going to be, and she's so good with that way. And to her credit, I never know what's going to come out of her mouth. She's very honest. Brutally so. But again, I think that's so against the traditional viewpoint that you would have. In fact, I was just speaking to her last week. And, um, so, right, I was going to say, well, she had her reservations, so that's why I felt comfortable sharing that. And I you know, perfectly okay. Try to turn it around as quickly as possible, but there's only so much you can humanly do. Are we good? You got some good stories? Let's see here what you come up with. Let's have about four different groups. Let's have 
volunteer. It will be the first to share the story. Yes, tell me your names. You read it. Tell me your names. And we'll start with Hannah one. Do we have animal names? Do we have real names? What's your first name? Jesse. Jesse and Brandon. Brandon. And then just lead me through whatever you come up with. Brandon's the alligator. I'm the cat. Oh, okay. Hey, I've been wanting to ask you. Something for a while now. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> now we're moving to panel two. We are. I want to know if you will do me the honor of. This is happening. I can't believe this is happening. It's going to happen. Making me a ham sandwich. <laughs> How about I make you single? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I'm the right That was clever. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Brandon. You're welcome. Never do. <laughs> <laughs> and your name? I'm Wilson. Wilson? Lillian. Lillian? Nice to meet you. Hi, Lenny. I got a surprise for you. Huh? <laughs> we are going on a vacation. <laughs> We're going on a cruise. That's great. What are you paying for? So how are you getting that emotion? And we all share the same interpretation. Um, their, their body gestures or how their faces were posed that implied a certain feeling. And so that was common for all of us. Nonverbal communication is what we call it in our case. Yes. The gestures, the facial expressions. Did anyone name your characters? No. But Wilson and Lily did something interesting. I'm assuming you gendered them, you sexed with them appropriately. You took Al. I'm assuming that you took it because you're thinking Al's a man, perhaps. Lillian was doing kitty, by the kitty cat, as female. And if you interpreted that way, why would you interpret it? Dress. The clothing. In communication, we call it artifacts. In this particular time, in this particular culture, we interpret those artifacts as being belonging to male and female. If they were dressed differently because they're animals, we don't know. Obviously, there were male and female alligators and there were male and female cats. So they could be either underneath those clothes. We have no idea. But we are putting that idea onto it from a human perspective that that's the interaction. And it leads into eventually what I'm going to be basically talking about, which is the nonverbal display of masculinity, gender performance, in the context of Italian culture. This is the setting and the environment that I studied in. This is taking you into the social science background. This is a town where I studied with UCF in 2006 on a study abroad program called Bear Remo. It's an hour northeast of Milan. Bear Remo is very old, as you can basically tell from the pictures, and it's split into two parts. I'm taking the picture from the lower town called Cittabasa, which means the low city, and we're looking up to Citta Alta, the high city. Citta Alta is extremely old, and it was ruled for a couple hundred years by the province of Venice. Venice was incredibly wealthy, and its uh, territory extended over a good portion of Italy really for a period of time. It's also highly Catholic. Even today, a lot of the um, real estate in this area is owned by the Catholic Church. That comes into play because those are going to influence what happens on the old city versus the new city, the high city versus the low city. Who you see in those areas of town also differ. Bergamo, like Italy as a whole, has a good deal of immigrants coming in from all over the world, particularly a great deal of number of uh, people from China, Romania, and from Morocco were moving into Italy, and they pick up the language pretty easily. 
They do live in Bear Below, but they're usually confined to areas in the lower city. The upper city is held by the Catholic Church and the old time families, so basically it's Italian people. And while you're walking through the lower city and you're hearing different languages and seeing people with different ethnic features, it's kind of weird you don't see much of that going on in the upper city, and it's just as accessible by walking or by bus, all of them. So even that setting within the same town can dictate who belongs and who doesn't belong in that particular area. Another look at Chita uh, Alta versus Chita Basa. Chita Alta is still up on that mountain. This is particularly where I took a photograph that became part of the start of a dialogue going on, intercultural dialogue. This is Piazza Vecchia. This is the heart of Chita Alta, so the high city. And within this piazza, you have a church in the background. You can see a couple of the towers peeking over. And there's a street. I'm basically standing in a street looking this way. The street connects. And this street runs from one end of the wall on the old city to the other end. And in the evening, people do what's called passeggiata in Italian. Have you ever heard of that term? Passeggiata comes from the Italian verb meaning to stroll. And in the evening, when the weather's really nice, particularly in the summer, people get dressed up like I would, wearing the nice clothes that you would wear in the Sunday church. And they finish dinner and they just walk. There's no destination. They stroll it back and forth. And they get an ice cream cone along the way. They'll push the baby stroller. And Italy stays light until about 10.30 at night because it's higher in this region, so the way the earth is tilted. People are just out enjoying the weather and enjoying one another. They'll sit along the steps, they'll sit in the piazza and just talk to one another, maybe have a drink, but there's no destination, just back and forth, back and forth strolling. This becomes essential in understanding Italian culture. It's not just about enjoying the weather. It's not just about maybe driving an ice cream cone, even though know, the ice cream is really good. It's really about displaying your characteristics as a person, as a human being. People in Italy judge one another by their appearance. Italians do not run to the grocery store in their sweats or yoga pants. There is full makeup. Women wear stiletto heels on the cobblestone streets. And we joke that they are the girls. I have no idea how some of you out there probably feel they're not doing this. Uh, it's just different. You dress to the nines. Very important. People judge one another based off of that physical presentation. They also judge you not just by what you wear, but how you move. How you move the body. I stayed with an Italian guy in 2004 when I was visiting in Florence. He was the son of a friend of mine. And he, we went out together, he's giving me a tour of Florence, and way ahead of us in the distance were a group of girls walking. Before we could even hear them, we just saw the back of them as they were walking, and he said to me, those girls are from the USA. I said, well, how can you tell? He said, look at the way that they walk. Different than the Italian girls. Different. He can pick up on it. So the way you move your body is even influenced by your culture. You know, Gino, that's really interesting because many years ago I was in the Placa district outside Athens and I was just walking through the flea market area of the Placa and not speaking to anyone. And I actually had one of the shopkeepers call out to me and he says, hey, you, you American, I'm not looking at you, I'm not talking to you. And I said, how did you know that? And he said, I wasn't even looking. He said, I just looked at the way that you walked. And I said, how was that? Because I think we're so unconscious of it, but yet other peoples are so much more attuned to that. So I thought that was really interesting. They, Europeans are very attuned to this kind of stuff. And I do want to take you into to this discussion. There's no right or wrong, right? A walk is walking. There is no right or wrong. You can have your own preference. You can think that this type of culture walks nicer than this type of culture. And I'm sure you do have a preference if you looked at any variety of the way people walk. But there is no right or wrong in this. It's what you prefer. Europeans, because it's like states within the US, they're so closely integrated with one another, yet they're so dramatically different. They're so used to picking out mm. differences because they're interacting with different people all of the time. Mm. Um, this is, again, positioning you to understand the angle at which I studied this, and we're going to get into more of the discussion. So now I, what I did was I walked up here, and I'm sitting up on these steps that go up here, and I'm looking into the piazza. This is the university library, and this is the street where you see people strolling and walking. So I was just sitting in here on a Sunday afternoon doing some observation, recording some notes, and just generally observing, seeing what I saw. And then I saw, um, coming up in a bit, a guy that really stimulated the idea of this project for me and put into um, a visual aid the question that I wanted people to ask. And this question started to prompt an intercultural discussion. Before we really get into the discussion from the perspective of the Italians and then the people in the US I asked, I want your thoughts on this. So the first general research question that I did ask my participants was, 
What do you think of as a masculine man? And I want you to actually answer that question. Once you've thought about it, to share your thoughts. Yeah, tell me your name too so I get to get to know you. Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Um, muscles. Okay. <laughs> muscles. What? Where and how big? <laughs> Culture tells you what's right. What's right for you? I would say like chest, shoulders, arms. So you're okay with those guys that don't work out the way. Proportion, but shoulders, chest, upper body. Yeah, that's more the Okay, masculinity. What else? Your name? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd say typically, Chandler. Chandler. I'd say typically facial hair. I mean, usually the women like to keep her face like soft and clean, but I mean, I mean, I wouldn't let her look too much at her if she had hair all over her face. But I mean, that's usually a masculine thing to me. I would point out. Yeah, and women who do have hair on their face typically go to great lengths to remove it. Yeah. <laughs> but there are women that have hair yeah. on their face. Yeah. But women remove it and then grow it, mm -hmm. like display it. Sure. Uh, yes, I'll take you and I'll go back to it. Angela, um, Angela, and I think of someone who holds himself like really confidently and who like kind of demands authority with their like presence. Okay. You you just demonstrated for me. You said holds confidence. I was going to ask you how do you read confidence? Just like my Posture. friend read it off of read American U.S. American off the wall. Posture. So you did it yourself. You told the children that head tall. Okay. Wilson. Just the way. They walk and speak. Mm -hmm. um, body movements all over the sub five senses. What do you think of your masculine man? Are you all from US culture? All of you who spoke are from the US? Okay. A gentleman yet with authority. A gentleman yet has authority. Like someone that is not necessarily going to be like a chauvinistic head, but somebody that they still have, you know. So much believe in equal rights, but they won't be afraid of the war still for no one. Yes. Okay. Lightness. Any other ideas? Just um, the height. Yeah. Height. Like if you know, man's going like you know. I mean, I think you're a butler. You can get the facial hair. Sometimes muscles. Depends on the party. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm shaking my head yes because you're the first one that said it, and when I've done the presentation before, that's usually one of the first ones that comes up is how being tall. And basically a description from an American perspective is your dream man is going to be three adjectives. Tall, dark, and handsome. Tall, dark, and handsome, which is <laughs> a one cultural perspective. We laugh about it, but the point is we can actually say that. I said the three adjectives, and you can name them, and we're all shaking. Yes, we know that. We've heard that saying. It means that the culture has told that to us. And what that can do to people is if you're not fitting those descriptions, it can maybe make you feel less masculine. And we can flip this around. Of course, women get this all the time, right? All the different standards that are put on women. So this project is a little bit more unusual because men are usually not put under the microscope. And that's even a cultural statement because for us, in our general culture, men are not to be looked at. Women are to be looked at in our culture. Very different in a uh, Italian culture. And if you go to some place like Miami, which is largely a Latin-based culture as well, it is different there. You'll see men who wear very bright colors, sometimes bright jewelry to get attention. Latin culture, Italian culture, more similar than Anglo. Your name, please? Michael. Michael. Um, I'll say, like, maybe you'll see, like, people that are a lot shorter than average, like males sometimes. Like, at my job, for example, I have it. They'll go to the gym, like, way more intense than maybe someone that's taller because of that complex, like, failure to believe, like, you have to have muscles or that to make up for the height. The holding the complex that you're yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're compensating for a lack of height, therefore yeah. you have to prove your manhood through something else, whether it's muscle size or your personality, your attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Very much could influence it. So you already told me what he looks like. How does he act? We got confident. We got like a gentleman. What does he wear and what's his style? We didn't really approach that question. So this was a question I asked. In the research, a man that you would describe as masculine, what does he wear? 
soybeans. Right. Just going to have little studs on them. Yeah. Decal. Skulls. Skulls. Okay. <laughs> no rhinestones. So. <laughs> You're going to have back pockets. Boots and a bike um, jacket. Okay. Boots and a bike jacket. <laughs> Uh, Delisha, I would say probably darker colors, not like pinks and pastels and something like that. A friend of mine, she is half an Israeli and half Italian. She is from the U.S. and she knows I wear a lot of blue and gray. I do like blue and gray. I like other colors too, but most of my workout clothes are blue and gray. And she asked me, why do you always go blue and gray? I said, well, I don't really have many other options other than white and black. It would be like girls going to get workout clothes. All of your clothes are tight. My sister buys workout clothes. They're all like sports bras and yoga things. If you just want a pair of sweats, how is a woman supposed to find a pair of sweats in Target? It's, it's hard. It's hard for a guy to find something that's not a darker color, just walking into Target. So in some ways, even the manufacturers decide what we are wearing and working out in. Not that way in Italy. Just like I said, going to Miami, not that way. You will have orange pants, pink pants, lots of things used in Italy for men. What, how does he show his intelligence? This question was developed from a basic discussion of Italians, which I'll get into in a bit. How does a masculine man show his intelligence? I'm sure you. Hold it. Conversation. Through conversation. Should he start the conversation? Should he join into it? How does that work? I guess depending on the moment, depending on the circumstances. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I think he shows it more through his actions, like his accomplishments. You know, doing something that is beneficial because of something that he knows and that he understands. So, a man of action. Yeah. Can you hear me? Alicia. Alicia. Um, maybe because he's the loudest and the most um, charismatic when he's not. Okay. You know, so he's the one that I go for the talk and the outcome. Wow. Well, yeah. Well, a couple things you said that came up interesting. Yours was very calm um, for a U.S. perspective. A, a masculine man does stop. He's a man of action. Fewer words, more action. That tends to be the thing participants want from U.S. Americans. And you brought up something very interesting from nonverbal research. Dominance. Men tend to dominate space more than women, and men take up space more than women. So if you want to be seen as more masculine, and this can even come from a female perspective, because there are contexts, particularly in the business world, right, where you want to come across as masculine. And masculine does not mean man. Masculine is an aura. It's a presence. There are times if you're going to step in and lead, you need to have a masculine approach, um, an androgynous approach. But we need to know how to be masculine too. So standing large, taking up space, legs apart, shoulders back, all larger gestures, demanding more space. Even when you're sitting, the way you're sitting is a more masculine approach because you're spreading out. If you're sitting more closed off, you're actually in a very feminine. Uh, you're crisscrossed and you're small. <laughs> There's some research done by a, by a, I think, I think she's from Harvard, by her. One, one of the popular, you know, like really recognized schools. Her name is Amy Tuddy, and she, she's on TED Talk. You can Google her. She does biofeedback research on body language. You've seen it? So she calls it power posing. How you hold your body sends chemical signals to the brain. So when you're standing like Wonder Woman or Superman, either one of those, and you hold that position for about two minutes, your body actually sends chemicals of power to your brain. It increases testosterone and decre decreases cortisol, the stress hormone. When you're sitting more like you're sitting, it actually does the exact opposite. From the baseline, it increases cortisol, your stress hormone, and decreases testosterone. You feel less power and more volume. Right, so take up some room. <laughs> uh, but taking up space, so it's interesting that you commented on that. This picture, this picture became. <laughs> Let me explain this picture. This I took this picture. This is in the Milan Malpensa Airport. It's like Orlando International Airport, major airport in Italy. And as I'm walk, going to the escalator to go down to my gate, this is the billboard that's above the escalator, and it just really caught my attention as different. I would not see this in the USA at all. Would you agree with that? Or would not see this exact type of billboard in the USA? Does anyone know who these guys are? They are not just models. They're football players. They're soccer players. They're Italian football players. Yes. And that year, they won the World Cup in 2006. So these are famous men. These are the Michael Jordans of Italy. They're touching one another in their underwear. 
<laughs> they're looking at you and they're sprayed with oil. This is not the same approach. Michael Jordan's approach for underwear ads. I don't know if you knew that. He's done Hanes. But it's Michael Jordan with his Hanes t shirt and his Hanes underwear sitting on his breakfast table with his coffee and his paper alone, not being touched by another man. <laughs> so, the context of Italian culture, what does this start to tell us about their view of masculinity? These are their men, these are their idols. They have a different idea of masculinity. Absolutely. So, this, I want to know why. I want to know why it is different. What um, perhaps could be some highlighted differences? Michael well, Jordan's alone in his ad. These guys are together. That is actually embedded in their culture based in the, um, the I don't want to say Da Vinci. Actually, I, I want to say Da Vinci. He used to sculpture for men, you know, more than they would women. Mm. Um, would be, yeah, Da Vinci, Michelangelo in particular. Michelangelo, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, sir. There's um, Jonathan. Jonathan. You would never see that in American advertisement because Americans are a lot more individualistic. So I think with masculinity, it's more it's more masculine for a man to be like by himself or even like with another woman, be, woman because that's like him exerting his dominance. Like this is my situation. Where in like I guess Italy, I don't know if I might be wrong, but I feel probably a little more collectivist. So it's not more. So they're still pretty individualistic, but I would say yeah. more than the U.S. Yeah, yeah more than the U.S. So more. it's not as it doesn't demote their masculinity as much as it would in the US. They're much more social than we are. The piazzas there, they get out in the evening, I already said for passeggiata, people socialize, they chit chat with one another. And uh, when I was studying it, this was interesting too, it felt like the high school cafeteria. Mm -hmm. they, when men and women go out together, and then they get to the space and they split up. All the women are hanging out together on the benches and all the men are hanging out. It was totally segregated. They're in the same basic area, but they were not interacting with one another. Women dominate the home. I'm sure you like an Italian mom figure. That, that's her space. She basically can tell the man to do whatever she wants him to do in the house. And she can tell him, get out of my kitchen, you're driving me nuts. She, it's just known the woman owns the house, basically, in Italy. But men own public space in Italy. They dominate the piazza. That's their territory. Um, so it, they're used to being socializing. They're used to interacting with one another as well. Uh, not just because of teammates, but in the culture. They're used to that. So I asked some questions as well based off of this uh, billboard. And the question that I basically asked was what people thought about this. So the billboard is from Italian fashion designers Dolce & Gabbana for our 2006 underwear line. They actually were the ones that were, uh, this is another interesting statement, they designed the uniforms for the uh, football team, the Italian football team. It wasn't just some random thing, it's a national designer. So they even want their stars to look good. They designed their soccer uniforms as well as their suits that they would wear to different parties and press conferences. Um, so what do you think about this picture? That was the first question. We kind of already covered that. How about this one? What message is Dolce & Gabbana trying to convey to you? Because it is an ad and they're trying to sell underwear. So what message are they trying to convey through this ad about their product? Very masculine men wear those underwear. <laughs> so not all that different than Haynes and the Michael Jordan yeah. ads that have been done. If you wear them, you'll appear to be sexy. Or, you know, masculine. Mm -hmm. Does this picture not full description? <laughs> <laughs> These men are actually not very big men, no. That, that's the irony about it. They're definitely muscled, mm -hmm. but from the perspective of guys walking across campus here are much larger in, in size. Yeah. These men are just tough. And, um, what was your name, excuse me? Terry. Terry. Um, who do you think is buying this underwear? Who's it positioned for? Are they marketing to men or women? Mm -hmm. If this ad was in the US, who would it be marketing towards? Mm -hmm. Women. And it also tells you who the consumers are. Italian men spend a significant portion of their salary on clothing. They, they feel they always look good in Italy. And men shop for themselves. It's not their wives' job. It is not the girlfriend's job. They need to shop for themselves. So it's marketing to men, even a different audience than women. What do you think about this being displayed above the escalator in an international airport? Is it okay? Nothing shocking, nothing inappropriate about it? Okay. So this now was a question that is related to, I had to take his face out, and I'll explain that in a moment. This was a picture that was taken in the piazza here. This guy was driving down, and when I was sitting there, 
Uh, I took a picture. Yeah, right there. Okay. The reason is based, this is just in case you ever do research, we have something called IRB. Have you ever heard of the Internal Review Board? They exist to protect people from research that could be harmful. Social science usually isn't harmful, but it would be more like, we want to do this biological research on somebody. And here's what we're planning to do. Every, any research has to be cleared through the Internal Review Board to make sure that it is safe and you have to get all of your procedures done exactly. If you do not follow it, your research is invalid. It can't be published. It, it won't be given credit. And I have to protect this base for anonymity from this point, even though no one has any idea who this person is. But there he is, undeleted, because you will have no idea who this is. I have no idea who this is. And this was just a very simple question. This picture, in addition to the Dolce Gabbana one, stimulated a whole bunch of intercultural dialogue. And the question simply was, what do you think about this guy? And that's all I ask of you now. I think he's cool. Who said that, Jesse? Yeah. Why do you say that, Jesse? Because he's got his arm out the side of the car, kind of in a relaxed stance. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's going about 10 miles an hour. Yeah, he's cruising, he's scoping out the scenery. I think we would read that, absolutely. Other thoughts, just from that picture. Your name? Allison. Allison. Um, he's probably very confident. Like he's in like a bright car, and the way he's positioned up like that, just top down. Mm -hmm. He wants to be seen because it's convertible. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Yes. Tell me your name. Joe. Joe. Is the street cobblestone? Or is it, it is cobblestone. So does he have to go 10 miles an hour? Yes, he does have to go 10 miles an hour. And people, it's narrow, and people are walking, and they have to move out of the way. Yeah, but he has to go 10 miles an hour. <coughs> but he got money. He's driving a foreign car. Considering that he don't know if he's an Italian car. Right, it is an Italian. It, Italians, other than their luxury cars, they aren't particularly known for cars. Other than Ferrari, Lamborghini, those type of cars which are not accessible to the general population. You're not going to see a lot of Italian going in. You see a lot of German cars, a lot of French cars there. Any other thoughts before I tell you what they told me? He's single. Okay. Uh, why are you reading that? There's no one else in the car. You could be driving to see his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> or his boyfriend. You never know. Yeah, you never know. You never know. Yeah. Um, what we found from the Italian people that I asked, who were called the HG in 2007, they said he's not really smart. <laughs> That's what I thought. Why did you think that, Logan? Number one, I thought it's superficial. Why you have to show off yourself? That's an area people walk, not drive a car. You drive 10 miles an hour. What you're doing there? You want to show up, have people see you? In your background. That's not, I, I would not like him. So that means in your background, background tells you that's an inappropriate yeah. display. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, yeah, you, you're along the lines of these college students who said the same thing. How old does he look? Let me go back. You can't really see his face, but based off of his hairstyle. Yeah. 20s, so about college age, early 20s, <coughs> mid 20s at the level of oldest. What typically is going on when you're in your early to mid 20s? Yeah. <laughs> Single. Yeah, carousing in general. But from their perspective, typically what goes on in Italy when you're in your early 20s, mid 20s, is you're still in school. Their background and their schooling system is a little bit different than ours. Their economy is different than ours. So while a lot of you will be on your own by the time you're 22, 23 years old, and or many of us are older than that, these working professionals already, um, but a lot of people in Italy, even in their late 20s, are still living with mom and dad. They're finishing their degrees. So for him, this is what they told me. For him to have that car at that young age, means he's not in school, he's working, and he's making money, and to them that's not okay. Hmm. He should be educated, not worried about money at his age. Boy, is that very different philosophy, huh, than us. So for them, displays of wealth aren't that important. They're not backed by the intelligence in order to have that wealth. They're not impressed by wealth. Well From a U.S. perspective, this is where the dialogue of the country is so incredibly different. So after I explain this, I'm gonna step back, and if you have a chance to read um, the pages that I wanted you to read from the thesis, we talked about what that Italian context is as an indigenous perspective. So that was what they said from just that question, what do you think of this guy? Here's what the UCF students I interviewed in 2007 told me. They said nothing about judging intelligence. They said nothing about judging wealth. None of that came out. 
They said something totally different that never came out from these companies. They said, that car's kind of girly. Mm-hmm. And I said, why? The color, the size, and that it's a convertible. The Italians had nothing to say about this gender performance. They questioned nothing about this performance of masculinity. And that was the first thing that came up. Mm-hmm. Why? Raise your hand up. That'll teach you to raise your hand up. <laughs> why? why? Why do you think? Well, I know it's always like, it's like a, kind of like a stereotype, but whenever you were drive a convertible, it's like, why would you not just drive a hard top? That's like whenever I see like a guy driving a convertible Mustang, I'm like, oh, that's cute. Versus a guy driving <laughs> like a GT with a hard top that doesn't like, or a racing top that needs to unscrew off. I don't know. It seems like, it seems too simple. Like, oh, it's, so you have to, I don't know. It just seems too. It takes more cool. work to Jeep and you have to manually yes. wipe everything apart that takes yeah. forever. That's very push cool. button. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, as you're saying it, we're probably shaking our heads to actually agree with you because we're from this culture, but when you really talk about it, it's it doesn't make a car is a car is a car. If you get in it, you and it works and you can afford it, that's the best car for you. It doesn't make sense. Pickup trucks. Who do you expect to be driving a big pickup truck? A man or a woman? Mm-hmm. And probably a man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's just a car. A woman certainly can drive it. Our culture dictates these things to us. So what is it about the Italian culture that influences their judgment of this performance? I talked about four cultural contexts. Did, did, we, uh, did you get to read that information? Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, this is online. I'm not sure you're just going to run home and you can't wait to read the thesis. But so you can Google me, Gino Ferrati, Italian masculinity, and it is online. You can read the thesis if you like. The four major things that have gone on in Italian culture. The first one is the Roman Empire, which was massive over a long period of time and a great deal of um, geography. The Roman Empire, their art, displayed that Greek ideals. So as you talked about Da Vinci, was that you were saying? Da Vinci, Michelangelo, they were the Renaissance. They studied the Greek and Roman, the old stuff, the old art. So they were very much were into new uh, sculptures, new statues for both men and women and displayed their ideal of beauty. The men are extremely muscled, pretty much still fitting a standard that we look today. Interesting how the women have morphed. The women are much rounder. They'll show rolls of fat on their stomach, which is very different than our cultural standard of beauty for women today. But the men, they pretty much have that G.I. Joe character look still, of that ultra-muscle body. So uh, the Roman Empire was the first one. Leading then into the next one, which is tied kind of to that at the same time, which is Catholicism. Catholicism still very much influences Italy. Has anyone been to Italy? Where's Vatican? Rome. Rome. So it's in right there, it's its own little territory in the same capital as the capital of Italy. Has anyone been to Spain? So you've been to both. Yeah. Would you say they're similar or quite different? Uh, different. They're both highly Catholic though, right? Yeah. But so different. Spain is very liberal in a lot of ways. If you want if you want to party, if you really want to party, you go to Spain. <laughs> Dinner starts at ten o'clock. The bars open at midnight. The clubs open at two AM. And two years ago when I went, it was like five AM I can't do it anymore. I, I'm going home. In the club I'm laying in my hotel trying to go to bed and the clubs are still pumping, pumping, pumping music until about six thirty, seven o'clock in the morning. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Legalized gay marriage, quite liberal. Italy, none of that. It's really hard to find a club, a big zip code like that that's going to make noise in the city. They drink for sure, but there are not a lot of American style bars or more pub type of bars. Uh, it's just a different experience. When you drink your wine with your food, public drunkenness is looked down upon in Italy. I don't know. Yes, there are gay people in Italy, but it's more on the hush hush because it's definitely not a Catholic thing. You don't do that. Italy is very influenced by Catholicism. Catholicism basically wants to hold up ideals, ideals that are even uh, very old, right? And it, along with those old ideas are gender performances, women's roles and men's roles. Men or women get to hold the highest position in the Catholic Church. Men. Men only, right? Men only. And only within my lifetime are girls even allowed to be servers, only mm-hmm. servers. When I was growing up in Catholic school, it was just boys, ultra boys, girls mm-hmm. were not allowed to participate in unless they were doing the So it's only recent that those gender roles have been changing. How about the view of sex? Who is Catholic? Oh, so a okay. small, small portion of us in this room. So we're going to educate people. How does Catholicism view sex? Not so much. So usually it's 
typical Catholic parent will say, sex is great, don't do it. That's all they tell us. <laughs> don't do it. Or the worst thing that could ever happen to a girl is to get pregnant before you're married. Don't ever bring shame on this family. Don't you dare get pregnant before you're married. And those are the messages pounded into Catholic people. Holding up very traditional uh, gender roles. So there's this big dichotomy of viewing the body in a certain way. And women typically are viewed that they need to protect themselves, that they are never to bring shame to the family. And men are responsible for bringing honor to the family. And part of that honor is performing mass being made correct. So we have Catholicism. The other one, so we have uh, Rome, Catholicism. We have the Renaissance. <coughs> Renaissance was born in which city? Pulling on your history background. No, close, close. We'll come to Florence. Florence, it right. Florence. It, there was a Venetian Renaissance that was stimulated by the Florentine Renaissance. But Florence is pretty much like Orlando if you think of Italy as the same size as Florida, so both peninsula. And Florence is where Orlando is, dead center, uh, vertically and horizontally. That's where it is most in the light. And what is the Renaissance? It's from the Italian word Rinascimento, which means rebirth. Well, what was it a rebirth though? Art Art was <coughs> blossoming from this idea. Art was reborn. What else? Thinking. Thinking. Yeah. The mind that was the mind. They call it very yeah. Cool. Science. It was a rebirth of Greek and Roman ideals. So what was built in the Greek civilization in the Roman world was lost through the Dark Ages. The knowledge was lost. They had no idea how they built the architecture that they did. They had no idea how they sculpted the great things they did. All those techniques were lost during the Dark Ages. The Renaissance, humanity had gotten to itself to a point where they no longer had to struggle just to feed themselves. They no longer had to struggle to reproduce to keep up from disease killing the population. And if humanity was doing well enough and was able to support themselves enough, that we could spend time doing things other than just trying to get alive. We could dedicate time to art and science. Florence also gave birth to banking and loans. So with David Lawrence, it was really gave birth to uh, the profit machine. And you had the Medici family that blossomed and made a ton of money. And they often sponsored a lot of work through the commission, as well as the Catholic Church commissioning and supporting a lot of the work. So the Renaissance exploded, and you had science studying the male physique, usually, and that was coming from an idea, again, that women, men couldn't really study women, because that would have been inappropriate to be studying a woman's body. So a lot of Michelangelo's statues were actually his interpretation of women's bodies, and they're very masculine in the stature and body. Even the muscularity is very not female, very male, like a woman with, I mean, a man with breasts, basically, and long hair on his uh, sculptures. So the Renaissance very much uh, influenced it, and you had David, you still have a copy of David, standing right in the middle of a political center, Piazza Bank, Piazza Florence. Mm -hmm. So that statue, which is pretty much your standard, as I said, of masculinity, it's like the, the perfect youthful muscle male physique, is standing up on a pedestal for everybody to see as you walk by. This is the standard. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is uh, fascism. During World War II, you have Mussolini. And Mussolini very much worked to do a couple things for Italy. Number one, he established the idea of an Italian style and look. He actually made a fashion office, the government position, hmm. so they could make a distinct Italian style. They studied French style and then developed the industry that they did today. So a lot of what we know from Italy was really developed around World War II and forward, just like the civilization. He also worked to expel anything foreign. He wanted it to really be an Italian ness. And that came from the idea that Italy as a country was born during our civil war. In the 1860s is when Italy actually became Italy. Prior to that, there was a collection of city-states. There was the Venetian area, the Roman area, the Florentine area, the Milan area, and they ruled these larger geographic regions. But it was not unified until about the 1860s or civil war. So Mussolini has the big task of trying to make all these people who look different, because the northern people are German and Austrian, in their genetic stock. With the southern people who are mixed with Moroccan, Arab, a um, bunch of Spanish coming in, just the same rule southern Italy for a long period of time, people look so different. And their dialects are different. They don't even speak the same languages. But his job was to try and create a unified Italian sense of identity. And why was that important during his, his reign? Because Italy was the Gaulish It was. World War II. Yes. They were fighting as a country for the cause of, uh, that they were on. 
we really had a unified people to a national idea that we're fighting for our country. They were not loyal to the country, they were loyal to their city, mm -hmm. not the country. Um, so those are the four main cultural contexts. That's where I had to dig into the history and the background to really understand why Italian people behave the way they do. And in a future extension research project, which I haven't done, would then be the harder one as a person from this culture in the USA, because I was born here and have to live here, is to flip the lens back on yourself. It's called reflectivity. How do you flip the lens back on yourself then and say, what's our background? What's our history? Why do we behave the way we do? Why do we wear the colors we do? Why can't we touch a guy in a picture while we're standing in our underwear and that not be weird? What's going on in, in our context? Lots of things go on in those contexts. So, what's our story? We'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. We have about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. What's Trust our story? me, you're way more interesting than I am, so <laughs> no one cares. Right? Is anyone not from the USA originally in this room? This would probably be easier for you to start telling us what you saw with us. It's easier to see something weird. Something's weird when it's not normal to you, right? So when you're in the middle of it, it's normal. How are you going to notice? Mm -hmm. It's easier when, when it's weird. What was different for you? Anything that you saw jump out? Not just about masculinity, femininity, the U.S. as a whole. I see a difference in uh, family culture. Um, I'm from South America, and they tend to be more um, tight-knit. Everything is about family. Every event is about family, and it's a little bit more distant. How many of you know that it would be totally okay, your parents are actually encouraging you, move wherever you get the best job. You move where the money is. And if that's the other side of the world or the other side of the country, then so be it. Same thing? Your family? Um, I think what makes our culture the most different from every other culture is that we really have a melting pot, a mix of so many different cultures. and. While at the same time we're trying to um, encourage and incorporate and find inclusion throughout all of these different cultures, and so there's not really like a specific, a defined set of how a family is going to work out or how um, how an individual is going to grow up. Because like even in within our culture, with all of these other things, new cultures are sprouting from those cultures yes. as a mix. Evolution. So yeah, it's really like right here. Thank you. I'm sorry. Keep talking. Really, like we have um, such a hard time, or like I feel like we're really more of the front runners of diversity and inclusion within like the world, and that um, it kind of leads into our business and interactions with with other countries because we we kind of have a piece of each, you know. We have a representation from nearly every country, and so there's no. Do you know what the most international city is in the in the in North America? Is it New York? Toronto. Oh. <laughs> so the reason I bring that up is I, I agree with what you're saying. Angela. Angela. I totally agree with you that we have the ability to be. My experience at my age, I'm 35, is that I think we actually fall a lot, a lot short. I think we really fall short of, of some of that potential. Because you're right, we have the ability to do that. But what I'm seeing going on, and this is when I travel, I spent the summer in Montreal, I rented an apartment there, so I could get out of heat here because I meant to be here. Uh, the Canadians are like, oh, you're from the US. It's nice that you're here. People from the US don't have a passport. That's what they joke about. I've run into Australians everywhere I go, and Australians say, we're so sick of running into Australians. Australians travel every, is what they're telling me. Australians travel all the time because they're so isolated down there that they have to travel really to go anywhere. So we, everywhere we go, we run into other Australians. We're mm -hmm. sick of it. We want to meet other people from other parts of the world. We don't want to stick with Australians when we go around. So the international reputation of us is actually not that internationally focused. And the word I want to bring up to you is called hegemony. This was from a guy named Antonio Gramsci. He was an Italian Marxist. So his view of this stuff comes from what's a critical tradition of communication. Critical tradition, critical theory. We study culture, we study society, defining power imbalances. The way that society is structured to favor certain people over other people. And the idea of hegemony is what you're um, talking about in some ways. There is no ideal family structure. You're right in theory, but the show Modern Family is to try and really highlight to you 
that there is no more Brady Bunch normal or Brady mm -hmm. Bunch if you want it normal, right? Mm -hmm. They were trying to, to establish that nuclear family not being the standard. But in our brains, the idea of hegemony is there is a standard. The easiest way to think about this is 